Hey, everybody. Welcome to the American Songwriter Podcast Network. This is All Heart with Paul Cardall. Paul wants to shed light on unique celebrities and influencers who use their gifts to make the world a better place, like you. His guests are All Heart. Hey, everybody. Welcome to All Heart. I'm your host, Paul Cardall. Throughout the world, there are devoted, obsessed, passionate musicians that you might never know about because these are the players that go into the studio to support other artists. These are the musicians who build studios in order to support themselves financially. These are the musicians that have students. And for me, these are probably the most disciplined, most knowledgeable people in the music business. It is amazing when anyone who does music is able to make a living from music. I mean, the dynamics of getting paid to play is not easy. So today I wanna to focus on one of my good friends from my home state of Utah. Utah has a fascinating music scene. If you look at the classical billboard chart right now, you will see that a lot of the people on there have connections or ties to Utah. Lindsey Sterling, the piano guys, uh, some of my music that gets on the classical chart. You know, uh, the Five Browns, and then you have people like David Archuleta, Neon Trees, Imagine Dragons, who, you know, a Las Vegas band, but kind of got known in the Provo, Utah scene. You have all these amazing, amazing, incredible talent. You can't forget Donnie and Marie Osmond and the Tabernacle Choir. Well, Rich Bischoff has been in that scene for some time right now, and he has a studio up where he lives in Brigham City. It's an incredible, beautiful studio if you ever need a place to go and you're you're out there in Utah. And then the other thing is Rich, he's just a prolific electric guitar player who has worked on many projects and is now releasing his own hymn arrangements done as though David Gilmore from Pink Floyd has taken the hymn book and said, I'm gonna do some hymns. That's what this electric hymn album sounds like from Rich Bischoff. So I highly, highly recommend you go and ask Alexa to play electric hymns by Rich Bischoff, or of course, just go on Spotify or anywhere else and, and get the album. You will not be disappointed. If you've enjoyed the mellow, relaxing hymns that I've done for piano, imagine a soothing version on electric guitar. It's, it's awesome. So without further ado, here is my conversation with my good friend, Rich Bischoff. Hey, Rich, how are you? I'm good, Paul. Thanks for having good, me on, welcome. dude. Yeah, man, welcome to uh, All Heart with Paul Cardall. I always, it always seems strange doing that in third person, but uh, for the American <laughs> Songwriter Podcast Network. And Rich, you are, and, and tell everybody how to pronounce your last name correctly. It's, it's Bischoff and it gets pronounced Bischoff and Biscoff and every other iteration you can possibly think of, but it is pronounced Bischoff. And people out here in the I, South would people out here in the South would say biscuit. Yeah, gravies and biscuits. So is, yeah, no, I I was I didn't really get teased a lot, but like good friends would call me certain things, and you can imagine what they would call me. But <laughs> <laughs> son of a Bischoff. <laughs> yes. Great. Yes. But musicians are usually blessed with interesting names. Like I try to convince people to pronounce my name real fast six times, Paul Cardall. I mean, Paul it's Cardall, just- Paul Cardall, I can't yeah, do it. My parents- I, I think I, I, think I said your name. I think I said your name in front of my, my wife and kids the other day. And, and I said it completely. And they made fun of me for like 15 <laughs> minutes. You can't even talk. I'm like, try saying his name. <laughs> Honey, go play the guitar. You, you <laughs> so you're from Utah, and uh, we've known each other from kind of the local music scene in Utah. Um, and you're, 
I've tried to explain the music scene in Utah to people because it is something that's so unique. It's not a Seattle where there was a grunge movement and everything kind of exploded. It's, you know, it's not an LA where there was a heavy metal scene and everything exploded. Utah is just kind of its own little music capital for music people <laughs> from Utah. I don't know how else to explain it. It's just weird, Paul. It's all it is. If you're a musician, you're kind of a weirdo in Utah. And I think the culture just kind of doesn't get it. I mean, some of them do. But I think a lot of, if you're really serious about, um, if you're really serious, a really serious musician about what you do, people don't understand that here in Utah. They think you should be living in Nashville. They're like, why aren't you in Nashville? Like I get, I've been told that, like I work a regular job and people will find out what I do on the side. And they're like, why, what are you doing living here? I've been asked <laughs> that so many times. Well, it's interesting. So. Cause when I, when I came to Nashville, you know, I had built a studio out in Utah thinking you know this is this is how they do it how the big boys do it you know and i didn't realize after coming to nashville that like what you're doing right now and what i was doing then we are the big boys it's 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 this image facade that seems to exist and though nashville seems to have all the people flooding that are musicians that are really talented flooding to this place utah has i mean the musician quality in Utah, I've been trying to wrap my head around why we have so many musicians in the state of Utah. Well, uh, I don't know either. It's um, maybe just there's nothing to do here. Actually, there's a lot to there's a lot to do here. Actually, we've got the mountains. It's yeah. the, the winters. The winter seems to last a long time, but I think I think the culture here. Uh, I think art is encouraged growing up. Um, yeah. And so I think that's a lot of it. But for me, I didn't really have musical parents. My mom listened to like a lot of cool music and I, and my brothers, my older brothers are what kind of inspired me. Like I remember my brother got, <clears throat> he got this, like, what are the really small records called? Like a 45 or something like that. The 45s. Yeah. He got one of those for Christmas one year. We were living, this is before I moved to Utah. I lived in California until I was like 10. And uh, he put that thing on after he opened it up and it was sticks. It was uh, Come Sail Away. And that, oh, yeah. part where the, that part where the guitar kicks in, I was yeah. just like mesmerized. I was mesmerized. And that's kind of what like, I'm like, that's, that's so cool. So rock and roll, you know, for my brothers is kind of like what me, what kind of got me interested in, yeah. it, you know. You have so, five, you have five brothers. Five brothers and one sister. The sister's the oldest. She's lucky. She got out while she could. <laughs> she was teasing you guys. Yeah. No, she's she's great. So, why? What? What? What led your parents to go to Utah? My dad was in the Air Force, and they had traveled. He's originally from here. So my dad's originally from Smithfield. He served an LDS mission, and his mission president was Thomas S. Monson up in Canada. And so he, for those that don't know, Thomas Monson yeah. was, a, was a president of the LDS or the Mormon Church uh, for a right. very long time. Very long time. Right. And so um, he left for the Air Force, uh, and I was born in California. So while he was out doing that, like a lot, they had a lot of their kids. Like the first four kids, first five kids they had, maybe six were while he was out in the air force moving around and then finally about 10 years old i was living in san jose and they're like hey we're moving back to utah and we always loved coming to utah as a kid and so um what was your question again <laughs> well, well I, you pretty much answered it because i asked what led you guys to utah and your yeah. dad obviously you know he did he a fly over like a, your dad did a flyover like a stork dropped you in your mom's lap and then yep. now you guys are in utah you got five brothers and you got your sister but were you the only one in music or was everybody in music so my the brother that the brother that's just too older than me he like was in the madrigals at box elder high school and he's the one that loved sticks and he still just taught he still obsesses about sticks all the time he still loves that band and um and i still love those guys too but he he's like stuck in 
stuck in the 80s. I kind of am too. I think we all are kind of still stuck in the 80s, right? Yeah, I think um, so. I think so. <laughs> first, so. In fact, in fact, Rich, the first time we came to Nashville and went to the Ryman, Tommy Shaw was sitting right next to my wife. That's awesome. Yeah, I love Tommy Shaw. And she, and she goes, this guy looks familiar. I'm not sure who he is. I said, that's Tommy Shaw. She's like, Tommy yep. Shaw. I'm all, sticks. Come sail away. She's like, oh, oh, I got to get a picture. Got to get a picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And that guy, that guy is awesome. He was kind of, a, as I grew up, because of my brother, that guy was kind of an inspiration because he played guitar and sang, right? You know, yeah. and I'm like, this guy's amazing. And so my oldest brother um he does music sort of he really and he really tried really hard to try to put out some like um uh, more spiritual music he was kind of that thing and he was trying to put his stuff into like deseret book which is kind of like the utah um you know all they're, of our deseret book they're a christian um, bookstore for the lds right uh, yeah LDS so he so he was always trying to do that and uh got me into recording like he bought a four track when he was in college and I was like probably only like 17 I was like oh he got a four track you know I thought that was so cool you know cassette tape and so he's kind of the one that kind of led me down the path but the thing about um what really got me going with guitar was I, I kind of grew up thinking that was like this other worldly thing like that I only saw on MTV like you couldn't really do that as a real person I thought that was yeah. like oh those guys are like in LA and that's amazing how can I can't do that I'm just a kid and so I had a paper route and so I'd be doing my paper route and there's this kid that played guitar about two blocks two three blocks away from me and he had his window open and it was upstairs like a split level house and uh, I saw him up there jamming well first of all it was the scorpions is what he was playing <laughs> <laughs> and, and and at first I just thought that was the record. I'm like, oh, someone's cranking some scorpions out their <laughs> out their window. And I look up and it's just him playing it. And I was like, wow, wow. you can't wow. do that. You're just a kid. Wow. So I went I I went and knocked on his door, and he didn't answer, and because he was playing too loud. So I, I let myself in, Paul. Of course you did. I walked into I walked into this kid's house, and. I walked and I just walked to where his bedroom was and just kind of stood in the doorway while he was playing. He looked up and I scared the hell out of him. He like jumped back and I'm like, dude, sorry. I just wanted to hear you play. And he's like, he's like, for sure. And he was like, and I thought, you know, he'd be mad or something. He's like, oh, for sure. Come on in, man. Take a seat. Showed me his guitar, his pedal board, his amplifier. And I, I was like, I was hooked. That was it. That's all I wanted to do. Is wow. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh... That sounds so much like when I, you know, I was in my junior year of high school and I heard somebody playing piano and I, I followed the sound like a rat with the Pied Piper yeah. and, and went into the auditorium and behind the stage, there was a guy named Ryan Stewart playing piano and that got me like interested. I ended up going to his house. He started mentoring me. Uh, on how to play. I, I had already figured out I could play by ear, relatively, not perfectly, but I just watch him. And so, yeah, very similar, man, in how we see these guys do extraordinary things, even though they're right. just ordinary people. And then the way it attracts people, it, it's, I mean, it's fascinating. So, um, and then, how, when, when, when did you realize that you wanted to do music and, and be a guitarist full time? Um, I kind of knew from the second I picked it up, that it's, that's what I wanted to do. But just kind of my upbringing kind of told me, hey, that's not really something <laughs> that's possible. Like, I feel like my parents thought that was something that uh, was not a real job. <laughs> And well, because you don't play guitars in church, uh, in the church we grew up in. Yeah. There's but no my guitars. mom, my mom saw how obsessed I was with it. And so there's a, there's a guitar, the guy that taught guitar up at Utah State named Mike Christiansen. Yeah. And, uh, and my mom called him and I was probably only 16, maybe 15. And she's like, hey, my, this is how my, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you can cut this out. 
um, my mom called, this is how my mom is. She's like, hey, my son's good enough to take lessons from you. That's what she said to this guy. <laughs> I didn't know this until after she talked to him. And, he, and he's like, oh, really? And so I had to go like audition to take lessons from him. So she took me up there and I took two years of guitar before I left on my, my LDS mission. Yeah. And I learned a lot of the theory behind everything from him. Like I didn't really learn my style or anything from him taking lessons from him, but all like the, you know, how do you play behind these chords? A lot of the different styles is kind of how I, from him. So that was kind of, I'm glad my mom did that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It sounds like your mom was always advocating the quality of your life. She drove a half hour every week up to you to up to Logan. Cause we're from Brigham city, you know? Yeah. That's so drove, okay. Yeah. That's up to that Canyon. It's almost like, yeah, it's like 45 minutes. Yeah. And then I think, um, on my mission, I listened to, a lot of like singer songwriter stuff and possibly you, but I don't know if you were around. I don't know. We're the same age. So you might've been on your mission. I didn't, to I didn't release a record to 95. Yeah. 92 to 94 was when I, that's was. when I, yeah, I was, I was on one too. California. Yeah. Where were you? Michigan. Michigan. So we both had to learn English. Yes, we did. I had <laughs> to learn Michigan. They called it Michigander because they, they speak like Canadians. Like, Hey, let's go play some hockey. eh? They kind yeah. of speak like that up north. So you know what they say about uh, Detroit? What do they say? It's not Cleveland. <laughs> but you know what they say about Cleveland? Because my what wife is, is from Cleveland. It's well, not Detroit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you got Mo my, Motown in Detroit. When you were in Detroit, though, I was you in study Detroit. about Motown? I wasn't in Detroit. So oh. my whole mission... I wasn't in the Detroit mission. My whole mission covered everything but Detroit. Detroit was its own mission. So I was all over the state, like up in the upper peninsula, above the lakes. I served on, I like I was so lucky. I got to serve on all these lakes and stuff. But it's funny because while I was out there, I was always trying to find ways to break the mission rules about listening to music. So one of the rules was that you could listen to um, instrumental music. So you can imagine what I tried to do. I was listening to Joe Satriani yeah. and Steve Vai. <laughs> and my companions, I had a few that just did not like that. Uh, some of them did. Some of them were like, oh, cool. This guy's cool. But Cliffs over Dover. Yeah. <laughs> Eric Johnston. Yeah, Eric John is amazing. Yeah. yeah, that was interesting because that was one of the challenges I had on my mission was they, your full time. So for people that are listening, an LDS mission, it's two years, you're 18 years old. Uh, in our time, we were 19 years old when we should be in college, at fraternities, doing who knows what. We, we were sent to learn how to serve people, love people, and obviously we were trying to get people to join the, the LDS church, um, but you spend a lot of time in service and you're not allowed to listen at the time to certain music you could listen to the tabernacle choir right they were authorized and a little bit of instrumental music and occasionally a mission president who's in charge of 200 uh young men and young women um have a list of what they approve but here's the great thing my mission president loved john wayne mm -hmm. so we were allowed to watch john wayne movies oh nice but we were not allowed to listen to country music See, and, and on our mission, a lot of the missionaries felt like country music was really mellow. So that was something that <laughs> they would try to get away with. Do you know what I mean? And it's funny because my first mission president, who I loved dearly, he did not approve having a guitar out there. And so I remember I got out on the mission and I was out three weeks and I was going through withdrawals because I didn't have a guitar. I mean, that guitar was like attached to me my whole life till I went on my mission. And I had a companion, a companion is like a person that you're, you're with on this mission, if we're explaining what missions are. So you're always yeah. with like a roommate. So this guy says, well, you could probably go buy a guitar at a pawn shop, but just don't tell prep the mission president. So that's what I did. I kind of went and broke the mission rules or whatever. And it was just a classical, I still have it. I still have that guitar to this day. But yeah. um, 
I got out there and I got halfway through my mission. I got this new mission president and, um, I'm on a call or I'm in a, I'm in a conference with him or like a interview with him. And he's like, Hey, Bischoff, I heard you have a guitar. And I'm like, I got all nervous. And he's, and I'm like, uh, yeah, I do. He's like, that's sweet, man. I play harmonica. <laughs> so my mission for my second mission present was all about that. So I got to do stuff like in play in front of yeah. the missionaries for zone conference, all that kind of stuff. Well, fortunately now I think missionaries are allowed to listen to things within their own judgment of right. whether it enriches you or not. So, cause I remember in the nineties, it was like guns and roses. Use your illusion too. just came out. <laughs> when I was on the mission, I was like, you, you're trying to tell me I can't go pick up the new Guns N' Roses? I, I can't listen to this November rain? And, did and you I, and then, it up, Paul? You know what? We had a baptism. And yeah. so right after the baptism, on the way home, we cranked November rain. And I guess that's why it led to where I'm at now. I'm in big trouble now because I was <laughs> at the beginning you're, of the end. <laughs> yeah, you're, you, you're going to hell. You're going straight to hell. But it's great. It's great. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, it's funny because speaking of that, the only album I bought on my mission, there was an album by Rush that came out called Counterparts. And I went yeah. and that one up. I went and picked that one up and we would work out to it before bed, me and a couple of my companions. How do you work out to a progressive rock? Doesn't matter, man. <laughs> go, listen, go listen to that album. You can work out to that. That's a great, that's a great record. Counterparts. <laughs> the thing with Rush, I think all of us were influenced by Rush, uh, the trio. Right. Um, 2112, you know, I remember hearing 2112 for the first time. And I felt like, I felt like, you know, because in the 80s, they did the laser shows at the right. at the planetarium. You could but go and watch. the planetarium. Yeah, you could go see Laser Floyd and they'd play the music and lasers, you know, which our kids today would just laugh at. And then you have Led Zepp <laughs> Zeppelin, but then when they did Rush and they did Twenty One Twelve, and it starts out, you know, it was like, yeah. it was like, you can be because you, you saw Rush, and and he, he's one of the ugliest, but the in my opinion the greatest looking dude on the planet because he's yeah. the ultimate rock star. You can see those guys and go, oh, maybe I have a career in music. <laughs> <laughs> Because these guys. I, well, it's funny. It's funny. I think one of the first re one of the first times I ever reached out to you had to do with like I, I always think about like what, how much looks have to do with how well you do in music. And I and I feel I think one of the first times I reached out to you, there was someone on Facebook that was complaining about that whenever they do shows, they always would get they people would come up and say, "Man, you're beautiful." Afterwards, she was complaining that she was too good looking and she was getting all these gigs. And I'm like, you should be happy you're getting gigs because there's people that are way talented that don't get gigs because gigs they're not attractive people, you know? Oh, well. Like this guy. It is, it, <laughs> well, it is true that being attractive can help. Somebody left a comment on my YouTube channel. They watched this old version of Scarborough Fair. It's piano yeah. with electronic stuff. And the comment was, he has the ugliest looking face when he's playing the piano. And I felt vindicated. <laughs> You're like, yes, finally, somebody gets it. I'm like, is it ugly enough for people to pay attention? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you have I to make, look at I, everything like that and just turn it into a positive, you know? Well, and guitar players have guitar faces. It's way worse than piano faces, Paul, I guarantee you. We're like, Give me some you of know, your guitar faces. Yeah. I'd have, to hold the, I'd have to hold the guitar, but it's like, you know, when you're yeah. one of those high notes. Yeah, I, I can't do it unless I'm really playing. Yeah, if you're listening, you got to watch this on, on YouTube because it's on the YouTube channel. Uh, or you go to paulcardell.com forward slash podcast. You can watch it there. But but that's that's what's fun. These expressions on musicians' faces, you know, when we're, when we're performing. So let's back up, though. Okay. Did you form, how soon before you formed your first band? Um. So I was, I played in a Rush cover band in high school, but we also played Boston, but nobody could sing it, right? Because that guy's Brad Delp's voice was so good. Um, so we'd, ha we'd have our friends try to come sing, sing Boston. 
um we probably did some kansas covers yeah we mostly played we mostly played russian and i was fortunate enough that i found this drummer i went to high school with it was my same age and this guy that played bass and sang they loved rush too and so this guy would this guy that sang and played bass he would tape popsicle sticks to his keyboard like how getty could play the keyboard with his foot while he's playing bass yeah. he says he has yeah. all his pedals he would pop, he'd he'd tape these big old popsicle sticks to this old Casio and then run it through some amp so he could do what Getty Lee did. So these guys were obsessed. So I was lucky enough that I, you know, before I even left for my LDS mission, I got to play in a band like that with those guys. We played yeah. Rush. I mean, developed playing that kind of music, right? <laughs> who's playing that kind of music at that age? Nobody was, you know, we were no. lucky to ha have that. So then when I got home from my mission and started up to college at Utah State, I got into a band called Brother Sage and um, we got pretty big on campus. And the guy that was the front man, this lead singer, he was amazing and wrote a lot of the stuff and just the band itself, the music was amazing, but it was kind of dysfunctional. The people, uh, in the, do you know what I mean? Story of the so band. Like, yes, yes. I like that meme, Brother Sage. That's it's, a cool name. The bass player finally went and took our old CDs. Like we went and recorded with, um, what's that guy's name? Barry Gibbons down at. Oh yeah, yeah. We Barry recorded Gibbons first... recorded a lot of uh, artists who are LDS and LDS themed projects. And then on the side, he's doing all this fun stuff that really well, builds think, the character. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, I think we tracked it with the guy named Greg Simpson. And then he, mm -hmm. had, us, he had us mix it with Barry. He's like, oh, oh yeah, I don't Greg. mix it. Greg, I remember Greg Simpson, man. He he did all the the uh, music for especially for youth, which was a youth camp for LDS kids. And he's a, he was a seminary teacher, but he had this rock band, and it was cool because that's back when BYU allowed rock and roll performances at youth conferences. That's all gone. Um, um, <laughs> It's unfortunate. Just, just interesting ideas, or just random stuff to tell people on this podcast about uh, Utah. But uh, I, yeah. I think what's interesting, though, is you know everybody in Utah does take some form of training, piano lessons, because everybody's got big families, and it keeps everybody busy. Um, and all there my, was all that, my kids, all my yeah. kids play piano. Yeah, and it also had a built-in marketing uh structure and you know because earlier i'm talking with you about how, what is it about utah and I, I, i'm sitting here going well they had their own bookstores that sold music they had their own uh, radio stations that would talk about that music that's in the bookstores uh and they had a uh, distribution specifically just for those stores and so that's how a market can be established in that that community and that's why you have all these bands that have come out of Utah, like Imagine Dragons and uh, Neon Trees. And, um, you know, everybody knows the Osmonds, you know. But I think Provo had a lot to do with some of that, like uh, that Valor place. Um, yeah. And there was, there was a few venues that really encouraged some of these bands to do really well. And, and um because I don't know if like Imagine Dragons was in Deseret Book or anything like that, but they no, were. No, but there was a marketplace mentality. Yeah, that's probably what you're, yeah. I, I yeah, that all these kids that are connected to the LDS community and Brigham Young University would gather in Provo. We did a podcast uh, in season one. If people are listening, they want to go back with Elaine Bradley, who's the drummer for Neon Trees. And Tyler Glenn was the follow-up episode and we talked about the velour and Provo nice. and that whole scene. So yeah, there was a marketing mentality. Did you ever go down and play in any of that stuff? I, I always wanted to, but I was just, what happened with me is that band from college, I really wanted that to take off. And I, I think eventually if they would have, if that band was stuck together, we would have eventually been down at velour and doing stuff. Um, Cause that was before that. But I think if, if, Mike, our lead singer, would not have moved to Arizona and all that yeah. stuff. So what happened with me is once that band broke up, 
we weren't making any money doing Brother Sage because it was original stuff, really. And yeah, we, worked, we, we would make stuff at gig. We'd make money at gigs and we'd sell a few CDs here and there. But I finally just got to the point where uh, I was like, you know what? I just want to make some money. And I started playing in cover bands. And I kind of turned into this hired gun up here in northern Utah that like when the when somebody's guitar player doesn't can't show up, they call me. Yeah, I play in these cover bands, and I and I've kind of I, I kind of turned myself into that guy just because there's money there. Do you know what I mean? And I'm trying to support this family, and um, so that kind of took a lot of my time was playing all these cover bands, and but I liked it too because I liked my main thing is I really just like playing live. That's one of the reasons I got into it. You know, what's your advice to to people that you know they play guitar and they want to make a living, but they're obsessively focused on trying to make it uh what's your advice um don't do that because if you do that you're not going to be happy <laughs> you're not going to be happy doing that um i i don't know because there's probably people that are obsessed with making it that probably do really well but i for me that band in college they were obsessed with making it until it just fell apart because it was dysfunctional and so that's when I was like, you know what? I just want to be happy and I want to make some money. And so my yeah. thing was, is I just want to do it for the happiness part of it, but also make some money on the side. So I didn't really, I didn't really start obsessing about stuff, but I did try to release my own music back in the day and it did get into Desert Book, but then Desert Book dropped it because I was an independent artist. Um, yeah. But I don't know, for me, I can't be happy without playing music. So I just play, I, for me to be successful, my way that I've done it is I've had to dip my toe into almost everything. So yeah. I have my I have my recording studio, I have a YouTube channel that just hit ten thousand subscribers. <laughs> Congrats, man! Thanks. But it's I good have, because I, what you do on there is you you give really good explanations of the guitars, what you're doing on the guitars. You play different elements, and so in a way, it's a master class. That if you're a young guitar player out there, you you want to watch what you're doing and pay attention. What's your YouTube channel? Is there a... It's just Rich Bischoff on YouTube. Just type my name in. Okay, B-I-S-C-H-O-F-F. -F. -F, yeah. Yeah. And okay. so I do, a lot of, I do a lot of gear reviews, but one of the things that I've started doing was um, people really like this. They like the lifestyle things, like blogs. Yeah. So I do these gig blogs where if I'm playing, it doesn't matter where I'm playing, I'll like wake up, and just start gigging me or start filming me getting ready to go to a gig traveling to a gig playing a gig what it's like to go play gigs and then yeah coming home and those do a lot better sometimes than the my gear demos like my guitar reviews and stuff so i would so, think so because you're taking yeah, people so, on a journey exactly and so i've just kind of to live in utah and have a family and be kind of more realistic about things. I've had to kind of dip my toe <laughs> into about everything. And that's Sounds what you neat. kind of do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the definition of making it, I think is different for everybody uh, because the older you get and uh, you start to recognize that making it actually is the fact that you are doing it, that you have a family, that you're still married to the same person, you know, yeah. um, there seems to be this illusion, grand illusion that we create as fame and people want that. But everyone I know that's like well-known, they're still pushing and grinding and hustling, thinking they gotta do more. So I right. think we're all at these different levels on this mountain of how we define success but I really have a lot of respect for the way you've, you know, you've been very humble in carving out a niche. You know what yeah. I mean? Life's, life's kind of done that to me, made me have to be. I think I've always been kind of a humble person, but I think um, just me just trying to do some things. Uh, life, life humbles you. I mean, hello, look at your story, man. You've, You've got to be the ultimate person that's been humbled by all the stuff. You've I'm just a guinea pig of experiments for uh, yeah. you know, right. survive and adapt. 
my pain is everybody's gain through the music. <laughs> I said I was going to complain about how my back was hurting today, and then I remember how many how many surgeries and things you've been through, Paul. You've had a heart transplant. I'm like, I better not bring that up. <laughs> I don't. I don't have to lift. I don't have to lift gear. I'm not I a know. drummer. I'm not a Gosh. guitar player. You they show put up. a piano there. It's the only. And when I when I decide I'm going to take a rolling keyboard like this one behind me, that's. 100 pounds or whatever right that just, that's i mean i like those gigs where i have a full keyboard and the whole bon Iver look and pianos and i did a show like that but i carried so much gig i was like this this isn't fun <laughs> dude tell me about it and i've i'm an advocate for there's kind of like there's kind of like this thing called gear snobbery where you don't you have to have the certain right right amp or tube amp for guitar players <clears throat> and a lot of this new digital stuff's come out and it's a lot lighter but it still sounds almost just as good as these old tube amps and i'm an advocate for that because my back and i'm getting old so i like calling around i, I like being able to walk into a venue with my amp in one hand <clears throat> excuse me one amp in one hand pedal board in the other and my guitar over my shoulder and that's it i don't want to have oh, a yeah band, you know all these trips well they make a uh, graphite clubs for old guys they ought to make these get this gear out of graphite i know right it doesn't sound the same you gotta have a wood it wouldn't sound wood the cabinet. same <laughs> <laughs> uh, what i have a great respect for the drummers i mean i think oh, i don't know gosh. if kids that play drums recognize the amount of work they're going to end up doing the manual work of lifting and moving and like it's what the instrument you choose I mean, <laughs> yeah, you you chose right, I think, because most most places have a piano. It's funny because I played with a guy for a couple of years. Um, well, I played with him for a long time, but there was a guy that um, he made friends with that wanted to learn more about the drums. So this guy would start coming to our gigs and learning yeah. how to set up drums. So one of, one of the drummers I played with had a roadie for two years. And we were just a cover band. I, and I kept looking at my our drummer and I said, this is never going to happen again. You need to just soak up every ounce of this. <laughs> yeah, drummers. Yeah, you got to have a lot of respect for them. Especially back in the days when they had drummers in the wars. They're oh, yeah. like, hey, you're signing up, you know, for the Revolutionary War. They're like, hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm a farmer and I play the drums. Uh, okay, here you go. Hey, wait, can I get a weapon? No. <laughs> nope. <laughs> You're just going to drum. Just going to hit drums. And march towards the the, uh, gun, the bullets. And and you can't duck. You got you to gotta just be very, very posture That's driven right. and look good. But you'll, and, you'll and get killed probably. God forbid you don't have to do a six time. Somebody on the other side will get, get that guy. <laughs> He's doing a drum pattern. I'm not too fond of. You are, you started doing some beautiful, absolutely beautiful arrangements of hymns for electric guitar, which I don't think there's anything like that out there where you can kind of relax to something that's a, a Christian based spiritual, uh, you know, cause, cause I've been doing this for years. The, the, you know, music that creates an atmosphere of peace and you're now doing this with electric guitars um take us down kind of that journey of of making that decision i know we've been talking for quite some time about some things you could do um how are you doing with this uh, electric hymns so like how did i start what was the idea behind it and how to start doing it? Is that yeah, because questions? you have a cup, you have a bunch of albums and you sing on them, but right. is this your first one where you're, it's just instrumental? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So several years ago, I saw, I thought, you know, what would be cool is to do like, um, like in the LDS church, there's these things called primary songs for the children. Like I am a child of God and, um, Love Father's one another. Prayer, love one yeah. another. Yeah. And I thought, man, that'd be so cool to kind of like do like this cool rock album of that. And so I started working on it. And it was mostly going to be instrumental. And I started working on it. But then I would just get so busy with everything else I was doing 
that it just never like happened. And, mm. and I released an album probably in 2019 or 2018 of stuff like singer songwriter stuff, which was just a collection of stuff I've been working on for the last few years that I just, I was so busy. I never released anything, which I should have just been releasing stuff all the time. And I just never did. And so I got to this point where I was like, I don't know what to do anymore with my music. Cause it's just really not, there's no, it's not gaining any traction. What should I do? And that's kind of when I reached out to you, but I kind of didn't have any, I don't really have like, I didn't know how to go about it. Like, should I, should I make it like a rock him album? How, how mellow should it be? And then you and I kind of just had a meeting and you're like, I think you should go like mellow, but make it still the electric guitar. Yeah. And so the so the first Tim I did was How Great Thou Art. It was the first one I recorded, and I let my I let my wife hear it, and I let my kids hear it, my mom, and I let my mom hear it, and she almost like came to tears. And I was like, oh, okay, this is what I got to do. So when my when my mom like almost came to tears because of it, I was like, okay, we got to This is what we got to do. I mean, not that I want people to cry, but you know, the guitar yeah. can evo- the guitar can evoke such emotion that way um as it can if you're playing a whole bunch of notes and rocking out you know what i mean so it was just me finding like on this tim's album it was just me finding that voice for the guitar that was still did justice to the hymns but also was something i enjoyed and i think other people wanted to hear if that makes sense yeah yeah man i i i think some of the most epic moments in guitar music is david gilmore doing Dark Side of the Moon and those moments inside there, the Pink Floyd sound, where it's just a little bit of guitar that lingers. It's not too much melody. And that's what you created and captured. It's like listening to David Gilmore doing the hymns. Yeah. Uh, And that's what's so profound and beautiful. And I think it's, uh, you know, I love this. Do you want to play something for us? A little bit of, play about a minute of, uh, yeah, Why don't you yeah. play about a minute of how great they are? Can you hear that? Yeah. You can turn it up. Tell me when. Here we go. Is that good? Yeah. Dude, that was that was amazing. I can understand completely why your mom, you know, obviously she's biased. She took you, you know, on those drives to get you all those lessons all those years ago. But that 
man, it's like hearing David Gilmore playing the hymns. It's like, <laughs> yeah. So are you planning I, to do a I lot wish. more of that stuff? Yeah, and in fact, um, I think I want to do maybe like, because I only did nine hymns on this record, I think I'm going to do another hymns album of hymns. Yeah. Which I think would be cool. And then possibly a Christmas instrumental album, I think would be cool. That would be cool, um, man. Yeah, just flood flood online with some of that stuff, because I don't, I don't know that there's anything out there that's hymns with the uh, electronic guitar. Well, I looked and I and I looked that up on I tried looking up stuff like that to see if there was and there really is not a whole lot. There's mostly just yeah. acoustic guitar stuff. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, dude, that's amazing. The way you're using your gifts, your talents, uh, the way you've been able to establish a niche. Um, what's your what do you hope? What do you hope people take away from your music and um, what you're trying to do? Um, I think with this kind of music, I hope that they just find some kind of, it can help. I, I'm a person that grew up, um, not necessarily having a lot of anxiety and depression, but later on in my life as like, maybe something didn't go my way or something like that. I had a lot of anxiety and depression. It happened for me where, um, and a lot of people don't talk about that stuff. I mean, they're, they're talking about it more these days, but I had a lot of anxiety and depression in the way that I dealt with it was music that was my escape and i'm hoping that something mellow like this that people can put on and listen to and just enjoy and you know all about this paul i mean your music is really healing for that that kind of thing yeah and in fact and in fact you probably hear this all the time but um before my son goes to bed alexa play paul cardall <laughs> that's nice man. songs by paul cardall on amazon uh -oh. music she there you that? go. She's <laughs> working for me all the time. Alexa's my favorite. She's my favorite assistant. Jerry's got to catch up. <laughs> right, yeah. I've got Alexa here. I forgot. Well, here's what my thing is, is that as a Christian, I like the hymns instrumental because then I can hear the words. They process because I know the lyrics from singing in church. They process through me and I'm being taught subconsciously the good word but i'm always looking for options and it's like i've always been like man i wish i wish alex lifeson or, or um you know joe satcharani <laughs> or eric johnson or any of these guys were, were christian enough to make a, a hymns collection so i'm really happy that you did it because it's it's edifying me and I know it's going to edify other people. So I think you ought to definitely keep doing more yeah. of them. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting to me that you said, like, if you know the hymns, you don't have to have the words on the record. You can hear, like, my melodies are basically the words. You know what I mean? The way that I yeah. played them. And so if you know the hymns, you're, you're hearing the words as my guitar plays the melody of the song. Yeah. So. And where can people get the album? Uh, and what's it called? Uh, Electric Hymns? Electric Hymns. And it's basically everywhere. So if you want to download okay. it on Amazon, Apple Music, Spotify, YouTube. I don't know where it's I don't know where else it is. It's probably it's everywhere. <laughs> so ask Alexa to play Electric Hymns by Rich Bischoff. Do you want to know the problem with that though? Is if unless you have Amazon Unlimited, it won't play it. It only only, really? only if you're a prime. Yeah, if you're a Prime member, it only plays certain. Like I think they only have two million on there. So you ask you ask you ask to play me. I know somehow yours is on there, but when my when my son tries to do it at night because he wanted, he's like, oh dad, I want to like be able to say, play, hey Alexa, play Rich Bischoff. All of a sudden it says, Alexa will come up and say you have to sign up for Amazon Unlimited to hear Rich Bischoff. So I'm like, eh. <laughs> really? You I think hear me, son. But I think on Alexa, for people listening, you can actually embed to where it's, you don't just have Amazon, but you can have access to the other platforms. Oh, yeah. As well yeah. in the app. So you could yeah. do it so that he can say. Yeah, I know. Hey, I, just, hey. I just need to figure it out. But as a dad, 
<laughs> I'm just like, uh, you don't need to listen to me. Just go listen to Paul. <laughs> my youngest, my youngest will go, hey, Alexa, play my dad's music. And she'll say, I don't have a relationship with your father. <laughs> so she, and then she, she goes, okay, love. play Paul Cardall. She's like, he's like, yeah. Alexa's like, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, because kids are not used to saying your name. Because right. your dad, you know, so when they go, hey, play Rich Bishop, they feel like you're a third party. Yeah, that's true. How many kids, I, your kids, your kids play guitar? Um, yeah, they all play guitar somewhat. Uh, they all play piano. My youngest has picked up drums and he's probably a better piano player than all of them. I don't know what it is about my youngest, but he has just totally got obsessed with getting good at stuff so like he said like dad what song should i learn i says go learn piano man by billy joel and he and learns the, even the opening the opening blues riff do, 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 do. and i'm like dude yeah job. that's not easy no and he learned all that by just watching a youtube video and then if you go to my youtube channel i've played with my kids we did a we did a cover of a i can't remember the band now we did a cover song of this band and I, and I said, Grayson, I want you to play drums on this for real. I don't want to have to throw in a drum, a drum loop or something. He's like, okay, dad did it. And we wow. recorded the video. Yeah. My kids. And I, I've been fortunate. My, my oldest got to play in a band for a really long time and had a lot of gigs. And now she's at Utah state and trying to figure out her musical journey along with yeah. trying to figure out what she wants to do for education. So how many kids do you have? three it's a trio yeah yeah you be the manager i know whenever they decide they're all just still trying to figure out life though you know they're young two are still in school and one's in college so i love that mentality that you're not pressuring them to do a specific thing that you're allowing them to explore whatever god puts on their heart yeah exactly and i think um because i grew up not having all the stuff that i have they grew up having a whole studio upstairs and I've just been like, go up and play whatever you want, you mm. know, but if it's an expensive guitar, come ask me first. <laughs> <laughs> but what's for your, the most part, what's your favorite guitar that you have? Um, right now it's this, uh, it's a Fender. Yeah. Right now it's just this Fender Nashville Telecaster. Yeah. And it has Stratocaster setup pickups in it so that I can get kind of Strat sounds, but I'll also do the telly thing as well. I so, love that. Yeah. Are you, are you so many twin Strat samples? What? I've used a lot of Strat samples, Fender samples, yeah. just underneath on keyboard stuff to enrich the, the, the keyboard for effects. Nice. Yeah. And then That's I think cool. a couple of years ago on a faithful record, we, we did a lot of Ebo. Did you do any yeah. Ebo? Any of that stuff? I, I need to. And in fact, like <laughs> one of my favorite, one of my favorite bands, uh, like collective soul, they were kind yeah. of known for doing a lot of that. And I always wanted to buy one. I just never have. I've just always been such a, like just traditional blues country rock player. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I never really, and, and, and I think for like what I'm doing now with the whole, instrumental stuff i think it would go over well on some of that kind of stuff so, oh for sure yeah. the the evo the uh it, it's a magnetism it's magnetism so mm -hmm. you're playing with this magnet but here's what's funny is i had a pacemaker at the time uh oh and and magnets stop pacemakers Oof. so as the guitar player was laying stuff down he goes listen I don't want to hear any complaining or I'm going to put this Evo right over you. <laughs> oh my gosh. It was classic. No, it's, it's, it was hilarious. That's funny. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. Everybody has a pacemaker once in their life. I just had none. <laughs> oh my gosh. People are like, Hey, my grandpa's got some of those. I'm like, yeah. how's your grandpa? He's dead. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Neat. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, that's why we play music to uh, to adapt to society and everything that comes with it. So, hey yeah, man, thank think, you. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, and I for me, uh, music is the only thing that keeps me sane. 
Do you know what I mean? In this crazy world. Like that's where yeah. I get lost. So what are you listening to these days? Um, you know, Spotify will make these playlists for you uh, based off stuff you've listened to. And uh, just recently, a lot of the old Huey Lewis and the news stuff started popping up. Yeah. And remember that song? Remember that song, Walking on a Thin Line? Oh, yeah. That's such a great song. And so just stuff like that. Um, Man, takes me back. Listened, it's great. Yeah. And I'm even listening to like uh, like old Tesla. I go back and listen to like all that stuff. I I do listen to a lot of instrumental like guitar music too, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the past, Paul. It's fine. <laughs> you got to be right where you need to be. You get your DeLorean. You can come back to the future anytime. Yeah. Hey, Rich, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Uh, you have a website. It's richbischoff.com. All right. Well, everybody go there, sign up on your mailing list, and ask uh, Alexa or Siri to play Rich, or because of that situation, just type it in Google Rich Bischoff Electric Hymns, and everybody can get that, that album. And uh, so, yeah, man, thank you so much. Dude, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate yeah. appreciate everything you're doing as well as an artist and just how um, positive of a person you are uh, with, with everything. I appreciate that. All an act. It's all an act. <laughs> I figured, but I just wanted to say thanks. <laughs> yeah, the smile comes from my wife. I, I, I you know, bought and paid for it, so. Anyways. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> all right, brother. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Paul. See you, man. Forbes magazine calls him one of the most listened to recording artists of our time, with more than 3 billion streams and 11 number one albums on top Billboard charts. With his podcast, Paul wants to shed light on unique celebrities and influencers who use their gifts to make the world a better place, like you. His guests are all heart. 